much more callous, but they seem to be a marker for a lot of people who came up to Lama who, who just felt like that it was different here because your feet could be dirty. So people who didn't like dirty, big, funky feet like these, Generally, had a lot of other things at Lama they didn't like too. <laughs> <laughs> was the benchmark? <laughs> yeah, separated. Sort of and yeah. if you if you didn't get adapted to this kind of thing, then you probably could never did get adapted to Lama. And then the next thing has to do with this Shiva, Siva, Shiva, whatever you call it. I call it. I don't. I don't um, particularly like statues at all anymore. But this statue was purchased by Steve Durkee and me to put upon our, well, we had it in our home, and then we put it on the front of this bright yellow VW bus. That was in 1967 when we came uh, across the country with our daughter Dakota to Valhalla. We were coming to New Mexico, and we had one other friend involved who had said that he would put in $20,000. We didn't have any money to find a piece of land and to start a community called, at that point we were going to call it Solux. It was a huge, um, it was a huge complex which had a kiva and all the tarot, major arcane of the tarot cards below and you'd walk in and then you'd get a kind of the initiation of every archetype. Then you go up to the top and there would be a huge meditation dome in which everybody would get in, instantly enlightened, I guess what was what our idea was. But it was a beautiful place, and actually the uh, Mancha Mandir in, in Auroville, when I went and visited there, is very much like that vision was. And then off of the side of it, were, would, all the way around, would be a kind of a Pueblo, which had 12 sections, and 12 different tribes would uh, live in it. And that was, actually that decision had to do with the fact that we had a lot, we'd been sort of experimenting with community, and we realized every time one of our communities broke up, that it was because of differences in ideas about what the style of living should be. People were being very experimental sexually. We were not. People didn't, were not having children. We did. There were people who were vegetarians. There were other people who were macrobiotic. There were other, and everybody at that time in the 60s was convinced that their way was the only way. So we realized we wouldn't even get enough people together unless we allowed for all these different ways. But basically, it seemed better to divide them up a little bit to avoid friction. Well. When we counted up the number of the bricks, it was more than 500000 and $20,000 wasn't going to cut it for that kind of a project. Plus, um, plus our advisor told us to start small. So we started small. Who was your advisor? Our advisor at that point was Herman Rednick. Mayor Baba had been our previous advisor, but the day we wrote him a 25-page letter with all our hopes, plans, and questions, that very day as Steve walked out to the mailbox, uh, to mail the letter, there came a letter from Baba saying, I'm going into seclusion, I don't want any mail. <laughs> <laughs> so it may be that he just didn't want to, he washed his hands of the whole project anyway. <laughs> that, around that time also, Richard Alpert, who we had lived with for a year, uh, doing a lot of communal kind of experimenting, had taken off to India, and uh, we had had three major fantasies. One was dome communities, one was um, um, spiritual dude ranches, and one was <laughs> centers for dying. And uh, so he'd gone off to India and our idea was to kind of, he would get enlightened and we would make a pad to create a center for enlightenment. But all of these words were kind of new words, none of us really had a profound understanding of what that meant in time and space. Most of us had had, most of the people involved had had some mystical experience or had some intimations of the unit of nature of the whole. But nobody was quite clear on how this would manifest. So when we got here and decided to start small, our first effort here in New Mexico, we lived in the non Bay Pueblo in a little house that we had rented. And Stuart Brand of the whole Earth catalog was coming a lot, and he and Steve were going out, and they made just a radius all over from where we were, all over New Mexico, a little bit in Colorado, but mostly in New Mexico looking for the land. And uh, we finally found this through a concatenation of events that um, seemed miraculous to us at the time. And we had, uh, and so we started, and we moved up to the area, and there was a, we came up with the yellow bus and a Jeep, a Nissan Patrol that Jonathan had bought, 
and all of our things. And we drove up to come to the land, and uh, the the uh, first intimations of the fence that now goes down the middle of the road was Mr. Roosh, who. This is an important story, actually, mm -hmm. because some people had come up to see the piece of land with four children, and one of the children had peed at the entrance to the land on the road, and her mother had wiped the child and left a piece of toilet paper. So the family down the hill, who had kind of owned this mountain psychologically for quite a long time, saw that piece of toilet paper, and that is what they've seen in the Lama Foundation ever since. So anybody who doesn't understand why that fence is there, it's small actions which create large scenarios. And anyway, her husband met us with a jeep and an axe and banged his jeep into our vehicles, took pictures which my daughter smiled at because she was used to posing in front of a camera. And so he was so annoyed at our non that we weren't reactive, he went and got this axe and he started swinging it. I'm not sure whether it was at Steve or at Jonathan, but whoever he wasn't swinging that went and got it from him, took it from him, we got back into our cars and went up the road with him driving after us, bumping the back of our vehicles. So we got up here and he had gone to the, he went to the state or the forest ranger somewhere, the police who came up here and heard our story. We gave him the ax and that was the end of the, the law that we'd heard of, but basically I think Lama has been very well repaid for our invasion on their property. And, uh, but I just like the point of the lesson of that one little piece of toilet paper in the middle of a wilderness where nobody will ever notice it. I don't, uh, you know, you don't get very many really great stories on that level that so many people have had to deal with in terms of our road. So now, let's see. So then our advisor Herman said to us that to start out what we should do is work a maximum of eight hours a day. At that point we were all into working 12, 15 hours a day. That we should have a meeting for a half an hour every day uh, and a silence for half an hour every day. So we started doing that. Now, no, at that time, in the, in the early 60s, people were not talking about God and love very much. Uh, those were not words that were okay in the 50s. They were too mushy, I guess. I don't know exactly what. So it was basically only people who had been to, into drugs pretty much and who were in this kind of new age wave that we're using that terminology. So it was quite a thing for us to start um, being silent. Well, who would ever heard of being silent? And um, talking to each other and talking about God and talking about love, that was a whole new thing. So we were very awkward and quite embarrassed a lot of the time. Not when we were quoting other people or when we had uh, gurus or teachers, but just inside of ourselves. So that went on for about a year. And meanwhile, we were building the place. We got Indians to come, and they helped us put a fence up because there were a lot of cattle in it. And we had to fence it to keep the cattle out of the spring. The spring rocks led into the same redwood tank that's here now, but it was up by where the kitchen was. When we got here, there was the foundation for a large house, which the dome is now on, and that was it. And somebody had bought the land, but they bought the it had been a mix-up in deeds, and they had built the foundation on land that wasn't theirs. They'd also brought a bulldozer up and dozed out the spring and, and wrecked the layer underneath which held the water in. And so um, what had been a running stream, you know, and a very rich running stream, had been destroyed at that time. And I think that was maybe in the 30s. It was before the Second World War. But anyway, previous to that, this had been, that water hadn't gone underground. The spring water had been an overground creek that had gone down the mountain, and several Spanish families lived down below at that point. Now I have to take a breath. That was just too long. A sentence. Applause. Applause. Thank you. So we were doing all of these meetings, and basically for the first two years we kind of made a mistake. Herman had actually thought that we would read spiritual books and do spiritual things. But what really happened was we would sit for a, a half an hour, which was a really good training, but we didn't have any meditation training. so. A lot of times you just sit, you know, and the day would go by, so it was very primitive meditation. And then you'd wait for the time when we would talk. And what we would do when we would talk was to um, complain about <laughs> stuff that we didn't like about each other. And this built up over a two-year period until there was just this 
demon reality going on in which somebody was it. I mean, people were coming and going all the time, and there were a lot of wonderful things happening. But when I think about our half-hour silence and our spiritual practice, which was the sort of basis and foundation of this Center for Awakening Consciousness, which we were developing, um, the silence, as I said, wasn't very well directed because none of us knew anything about meditation. And the, and the spiritual talk started, you know, it was all very well intentioned, but basically whatever the thought form that was going around about anybody that was negative seemed to be the thing that took hold. So if somebody would come and they would be it. Well, uh, Ken Kesey had had, always had an it in the pranksters. I mean, we had seen him when we'd lived in, uh, in California with uh, Ram Dass and Richard Alpert. They always had a dunce's cap, and whoever was it just had the dunce's cap up on, and they established that that was part of the society, that somebody was always <laughs> it. <laughs> but we weren't that sophisticated, and basically, and we thought, we also, I think, thought we were doing something righteous and real, and so I, when I think about it now, I just think of these poor people who became it. I mean, it happens at Lama now, and it's always happened, but at that point it was rampant because of of our lack of loving kindness, our lack of psychological insight, our lack of basic anything. But you know, that impulse comes in and, well, this must be true because I'm a child of God. It's very view. raw. And it was, yeah, it was very raw. And the people who came, I mean, it was the most victimizing, you know, the victim kind of people who would become it all the time. But there was always somebody. And I'm leading up to the reason the new room is called the new room. That all happened in what was called the only room, which was one room that we set up on the sides, on the wings of the dome, which was where everything happened when it wasn't good weather. And so um, these meetings took place in that room too. And uh, I don't know that we'd even stopped having them there at the point where it, the, the only room burned up, but we had remodeled the only room. It was just at the stage where the new room is now, totally remodeled, clean sweet. There was even a, a hot plate where you could cook tea and coffee there at whim after hours when everybody else was asleep. And the night that it was finished and we had a little party to celebrate, I guess Surya put a match down before it was completely cold. I mean, we don't know what started the fire, but there were papers in the cabinet underneath. So we figured, yeah, like a match f fell down there or something like that, and it started this fire, which burned up the whole thing. <laughs> and part of the dome. So it was the, um, it was sort of like the ash pit of all that demon stuff that we had been doing. I know, I mean, when I say demon, I'm talking about demons now as we understand it, which is the demons are these, are our nafs, or all, all the impure things inside of our beings. But at that time, it was, it seemed to me, I mean, who knows what starts a fire, but that, that in a way, we, there was just too much history in that room, and it was a kind of a purification which also expanded the size of the washroom, which sorely needed, because we had this tiny little narrow aisle and tiny little sinks for, you know, so many people coming, it was inadequate anyway. So there were blessings in that fire. Now I've, but I don't have a thread, you'll have to ask me a question. Well, I remember the great purification by water, which was um, when the same sort of energy was happening around relationships and a lot of sexual happenings and goings on, and there was a very famous photographer here, and this great meeting in the dining room Cartier was, Bresson. was Cartier, Cartier Bresson. Bresson. <coughs> there was this great meeting in the dining room, which was like llama soaps. Everybody was supposed to tell the truth of, of uh, marriage. their llama drama well, marriage. marriage. And, um, and that one was purification by water. This enormous hailstorm came along right in the middle of all of this, when it was getting to the juiciest part. And at that time, there was a skylight in the top of the dining room. And the hailstorm came through and immediately broke through the, uh, the plastic sheeting that was covering the skylight. And it was so loud and deafening that the meeting abrupted, uh, ended wow. immediately. And immediately following that was a flood through the kitchen. Water just <laughs> poured through. I was one of the few clear memories for me was that day, because of course I was one it of It was the very clear. You were one of the llama dramas, <laughs> sky of the soaps. And uh, so the, <laughs> so oh, the flood washed down through the kitchen. And 
and out the other side. It was a great day. <laughs> and the French crew didn't It was come. really a cut. That Stop, was enough, finish. finish. That's really, that's amazing because I don't even remember that part of it. Right? What I remember was Cartier Bresson and this French crew who were over at my house, just astonished at people sort of outering their inner and deepest, most, especially such painful feelings. I mean, it was a real, that was a really painful event. But he was really nice. He sent us photographs of, I mean, he sent copies of all these photographs he had taken. So there was fire and there's water. What other purifications well, are we the waiting? Great tower fire. The tower fire. The tower fire. fire. There was a garden yeah. a fire. Yes, I lived in it's those very, places. <laughs> and wasn't the intense. Shiva on top of the garden A? No, what? I had given it to, oh. um, I can't remember. It was behind, oh, I can't remember it. It moved around, it has oh. moved around. Okay. It has moved around. But the garden A fire, no, the ca garden A fire, when the garden A burned down, actually, Billy was living in it. Yeah. And there was a power, there was a fire that was too hot in the stove. But there was a, an, an earlier fire also oh. in the Garden A, which was um, a, a ladder falling down on a kerosene lamp, oh. which was pretty terrifying too. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Tower Fire. Well, I wasn't here for the Tower Fire. Steve Durkee was having that. Uh, Steve Durkee says he was in Jerusalem and he had heard somebody else was moving into it and they had written and asked to stay here and had been refused. So he claimed responsibility. I don't know if this <laughs> would have happened we were after Virginia at the same time, but I was sorry that it fell down. I, it was I a was great, here but later. I always think of the tarot deck when I think of that um, that fire because I had I was pregnant with my youngest child, Savitri, and, and uh, Steve was... Uh, was his name Steve then? I don't know what his, his name had been changed. I guess Steve was already, Steve and Francis were already very much in love. And I think Hans had left her husband. And I, and I was heroically, I thought, trying to overcome jealousy. Because I thought if I could overcome jealousy and watch oh. the steps, because this was a place you could watch the steps, yes. then what, what a blessing it would be for the history of mankind, right? <laughs> I failed miserably. <laughs> I never did overcome it. I just <laughs> surrendered to the facts and got a divorce. And, but anyway, he had built that house during that whole kind of event while I was pregnant with Sabi. And, and, uh, and so, so when it burnt, so our whole marriage and, and a whole lot of other things kind of fell apart. My, my clear image of life being a whole piece was definitely gone. So living, so the tower house always reminded me of that card with people falling out. Side of it. I mean, not like my own yes. ego breaking or anything. It was my whole family falling apart. I mean, we had built this beautiful addition. There's another thing about Lama about the Tower House, though, too. It's great that it's gone. Because, number one, it was like this great big phallic symbol on the mm -hmm. side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And also, it was a place of privilege. I mean, there's no right. question that it was the Tower. I mean, when I came back here and I was coordinator here, I mean, it was like I was. I mean, I got to live out some kind of queen fantasy, mm -hmm. sitting up there looking out at everybody else. And not, I, I never felt a bit of guilt about it or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely on a trip. You know? I mean, and the tower was definitely some kind of yeah. a trip. So it's just as well. Not only that, but like most of Lamas, anybody who's been here since knows, it was built by novices. I mean, nobody was experienced in carpentry. And anybody who ever came here who was experienced was highly frustrated <laughs> <laughs> by the fact that we, we had come here because there were no building codes and there was cheap land and, the, and so there was no building inspectors and in, in some way seeing what's happened here I can see the advantage of building inspectors but I think our attitude about the buildings themselves had to do with like the same as prayer flags you know you put up a prayer flag and it flies in the wind and then it evaporates and Lama was a sort of instant ruin that um, <laughs> gave one a sense of history. The generations long. of people had to try to rebuild year uh -huh. after year. And everybody got me. Well, it will remain that way. I mean, that's part of its karma has this, because has this, now it's 20 years old, which is ancient in American terms. So the, so the tower house um, was built on 26-foot poles that were dipped in a little bit of tar. Right. <laughs> so and then they were put kitchen. in concrete 
blocks that were about one and a half feet deep into the ground and it went 26 feet up. Not only that, but it was built without any diagonal support. I didn't know anything about building at that time. You know, I mean, I could hammer and I could do those kind of things, but I really knew nothing about building. So when you, I mean, I, so I wasn't worried about it. Steve actually had learned a little bit about building by the time he'd finished, and he was nervous because <laughs> when the wind blew. Like a little knowledge is but, a dangerous thing. <laughs> but I wasn't at all nervous. Because <laughs> I didn't know, you know, how dangerous it was. But I do remember at some point I thought, I looked at the poles and I thought, God, rain goes down those poles. Doesn't the wood rot underneath? And then I start. Then I did start thinking about it. And then I poked in, and of course it was. They were half rotten. Mm. The poles were half rotten and would have had to have been repaired. It was definitely dangerous. We did put turnbuckles in it. Finally, you know, cross me. Somebody came and said, "This is dangerous." You know, we put <laughs> turnbuckles into it. But um, so, it, I just got a telephone call from Ariel, saying the tower house burned down and. I, as soon as I found out nobody was hurt, it was sort of a relief that all that history and all that kind of, it was the Shiva energy we came in with, you know, I mean, Shiva is a great energy, it gives, makes people get born and gets them dot dead and, you know, keeps the energy moving around, but it doesn't care, it's like Aphrodite, you know, it's pretty indifferent about how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> So now, the, now Lam is in this Vishnu maintenance stage, and it's probably, oh. you know, I mean, everything has its time. But how does the Earth plane seem to you now at Lama? Here at Lama, well, I think you're getting a different kind of people coming here. I mean, people who came before were adventurers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't people who were looking for safety or security or even necessarily God. A lot of people came who wanted to show how close they already were to God. <laughs> <laughs> for instance, I remember this one guy who came up who was, uh, who was definitely enlightened. I mean, he was convinced he was enlightened. He came up and we had, we, were, he, we had dug the hole from the spring house all the way down to here to bury the water from the spring and get it down into the wash house. And we did have a little tea. But we, no, I don't even know whether we had the kitchen designed in yet. One of the first things we did was build, dig, hand dig a five foot trench from the spring down to here. And then the women. No, we didn't hand, hand dig it. Did we? I can't even remember whether there was a back. Then we must have had a backhoe. I can't imagine we hand dug it, but we might have. Anyway, so. Uh, so this guy came, well, Henry Gomez and all the Indians were here. This is good, too. I mean, they were our real connection, and they brought their horses up, and so this Indian crew was, would be here all week. First they built the fence, and then they made the adobe. So this bowl right here had me sitting under a, a, a tarpaulin, chopping straw, and my babies, all my kids, and then all the men and women were in the mud with the horses, and the horses would plow the ground and then we would have a hose coming down from the spring or maybe it was from the redwood tank which was up by the pinon tree. Well that pinon tree should have a name, it's a famous mm -hmm. tree. And uh, Name it. I can't, I've tried many times. I dreamt it was chopped down one time and I woke mm -hmm. up like it was one of my worst nightmares. Ooh. It's, it's grown about 10 feet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yesterday when I was sitting with it, it, it just seemed very ancient, uh -huh. like it had seen I've seen a lot. Anyway, so the, <laughs> the adobes were made there, and then they were over on the volleyball. We dried them out on the volleyball field. Anyway, so these horses were tied o up over kind of where the wash house is, but a little further over. And one day, one of the horses was tied on a rope that was such that when it went to jump the ditch that came down, it caught its neck, broke its neck, and fell upside down into the ditch. This is right by the kitchen. Ooh. So here we are <laughs> with this huge horse carcass. You know, these five Indians and Steve and me and, and I don't, I can't remember who was there at the time. There was a smattering of people who would come and go, but nobody ever stayed very long. But anyway, but we were known by this time. We'd sent out this brochure that said we're a center for the awakening of consciousness. Come out in the world. So this guy who knew everything came up, and uh, he said he was a Tibetan yogi. So and he, you know, 
I don't know. So I just set him up because I've read enough of, of spiritual lore to know what people like Marpa did. So I figured I'd pull a <laughs> Marpa on him. And he said, and so I said, well, okay, we'll give you a really good one. Um, I was thinking, I guess, about death meditation. And so I assigned him to burning. We had decided the way to get rid of the horse was to burn it. Because if we didn't have any vehicle or anywhere to put it, nobody wanted to dig a hole, right? So we figured if we burnt, <laughs> that was the best thing to do. So we were burning this horse. I mean, uh, keeping fire going under it, uh, and on top of it, and around it, and smelling it, and pouring gas on it. <laughs> so I figured, well, this this guy is as tough as he says. He, he'll be able to do this meditation. I and so he he did it for two days, and he left. <laughs> And, and then after return. that, the dog started coming and eating. You know, I mean, I was brought up in a large city, and it was most of us were who came here. I mean, it was mostly people who came from urban areas who came to do it. So we knew little, very little about, you know, primitive living conditions. And the idea, you know, the insides of animals, for instance, animals are something that come in a package in the grocery store. You know, or maybe you have a pet at home. but. Suddenly, this large car carcass started turning into meat because the dog, you know, a dog would come up the hill with its owner, and then it would tear off a piece of meat, and then there would be a piece of cooked meat on the ground that looked just like what you ate when you ate meat. Of course, we didn't eat meat here, so <laughs> it wasn't even useful on that level. The Indians would catch, the, and they, and the Indian boys came up with their guns, and one time they caught, they they shot Jonathan's cat Baba. Oh. <laughs> Because they thought it was a squirrel. We always wanted to fade it, but we never asked. Because we never served them any, any meat. At that time, the yellow bus was up now where the wood chopping area is. Oh. And then I had a little garden. It's the dumbest little garden you ever saw. It, everything at the end of the year was about this high, except four gladiolas <laughs> on the four ah. corners that stuck. <laughs> Oh, God, and there's tomato stories, too. Isn't that bus where Ram Dass wrote, Be Here Now? No. That was No, that, that bus was a there. bus. When Ram Dass, when Richard Alpert and Steve Durkee and I and a woman named Jane lived in Los Altos, he was unscrambling a whole bunch of new math studies that he had helped think up, and nobody knew how to grade them at Stanford. And we were all living together doing... Um, lectures on set and setting for, he was giving lectures on set and setting for taking LSD and we were all taking Sandoz acid every week and Steve and I were kind of sidekick and Dakota was sort of sidekicks to his thing and we bought this bus with the fantasy of taking the bus on our lecture tour which was going to teach everybody to please stop being um, so careless with the use of acid. Oh. The mafia had taken it over by then, so the vibe had changed. When you went before the mafia took over the acid trip or got into it, it was a very clean and spiritual kind of event that went on, and it changed radically as soon as um, as soon as the sort of it got that illegal status that it managed to get. But anyway, we had this plan with this bus of driving all over the country and kind of enlightening everybody about set and setting for acid and how to be safe with it. And, and Rondas had given some lectures and people were filled with this love that the acid had opened up with them and they didn't know what to do with it. So we had started this mailing group thing called Solco. It was kind of a, it's kind of a, a <coughs> dear Abby of the spirit, you know, <laughs> what shall I do? And I, you know, I was sitting there answering all these letters. <laughs> Were you the dear Abby? It was dear Ramdas, but it was Solco. You know, I mean, he was. We were all into anonymous art at that uh -huh. time. I mean, nobody was to take credit of anything because we were one. You know, we were a group mind as much as uh -huh. we could. So yeah, I mean, nobody else wanted to answer it, and I thought it was sort of entertaining. <laughs> and I was a good letter writer. I mean, I had been writing letters all my life, so it was a perfect vocation. <laughs> anyway, so that had also. I mean, Lama had kind of started there at that house when we had Solco, and. Um, then picked up a lot of momentum when we'd gone back east. So, but this is too far back. I mean, it's too long. Ask another question. Or maybe I'm through. Maybe we're up to five years. Are we up to five years yet? When one of you came. <coughs> How does Lama look to you now? What's your current take and perception on 1990 Lama Foundation? the earth plane, the beings here. I like it. There's a maverick place in me 
that finds it a little bit tame. Mm -hmm. That there's a maverick place in me that feels like, you know, whatever, there's something. I know in the personal interchange among the people who are here, that's always operating because egos are always bumping up against each other and there's that teaching and that tuning that's always going on. And I, and I really feel like that Lama has surpassed my wildest dreams when we started the Lama Foundation. Because mm. I couldn't have even thought this far along of people working in harmony together and just, um, well, you meet a Lama, you meet somebody who's lived at Lama and there's a kind of a telepathic communication that goes on that you don't mm -hmm. find in the ordinary world. Mm -hmm. And that I have had it all my life with certain people, but, but at Lama it develops in everybody in such a way that anybody who's been at Lama who wants that kind of communication can have it with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's a really kind of just a nice tuning. Um, and there's a lot that just stays the same because by, by virtue of the primitive conditions here, I mean, it's very minor that there are electric lights, and it's very minor. That if the if if the wires went down and were plugged into the grid, you know, the planetary grid of the electricity, I think the vibe here would be really different. And the telephone has changed it relatively less than I thought it would. Mm. And I I think those changes are really necessary. But how how I, how do I see it now? Well, I'm thinking of coming back here for a couple or three months in the spring. All right. They will have you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. A few years ago, I came here and I had the definite understanding that I would never get consensus to come here, given who, how, who, and how I am, unless I had been one of the founders. <laughs> you know, and I question that. I mean, I do feel like we should have not psychologically crazy people, but more. Maverick, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, more kind of far out people, and even if they're really obnoxious, just, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, just have a slot for a maverick kind of person uh -huh. to be here because that kind of craziness stirs things and lets us see inside of ourselves that part, you know, so that you're not, and, and there is one other thing about the whole issue of children and people staying here for a long time, which it is, is it tends to keep you out of touch with the current mainstream way it is. Now, I don't know how different, I mean, I've been gone for 10 years, so I, I'm now tuned more to how the mainstream is, and it's very, I've adapted to it, so it doesn't even look peculiar to me now. And I would love to be able to just kind of get ahead of what it's like to be here for long enough to have forgotten what mainstream is, or what, I mean, it was very alien to me when I first went down into the world, just having to mm -hmm. look like a, well, I never managed to, but to try to look like <laughs> sort of normal person. And now I'm now I kind of think I do. It was probably because I became a nurse and I can wear white uniforms. <laughs> How does it look to me now? That's a really interesting question. I don't know why it's not drawing more people, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean my question you know, I guess my question also has to do with what are the needs in, in America today? So much of what Lama started out as a vehicle for has now been integrated into the society, right? Mm. Food, you know, what's necessary, what isn't necessary, what, you know, solar heating, we were big into solar stuff when we first started, a whole lot of so sociological things that we had been interested in. What do you need? How is the nuclear family in relationship to community? How does community interact? All of those things have been pretty well looked at and people are now free to make kind of choices that are freer and the mores are changing and so it'll be, I guess it'll just be really interesting to see. I think at this point I don't know because I, I know that the, I know that the light in the prayer room and that the space in the prayer room hasn't changed and it's essentially, all the places I've been in the world it is at least as if not more of a clear place to sit. Mm -hmm. And I might add for me, a little more clear when nobody else is in it. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's cl a clearer place to sit than my own sitting space, even. So that I, I, would, I would say that from my own experience that um, that's working and that's still the center of Lama and that the intensive study center has, has still not functioned the way I see it as far as I can mm -hmm. tell. 
as an intensive study center for people who really, really want, want to do retreat but just don't, sim don't want to be away from all other mammal, you know, two-legged mammals. You know, that it's like a retreat. I, for me, I always see that place as a place that should be for intensive interior work, which is basically silent, but that you can just have some kind of other people around, like a real monastery. And I, I mean, I'm continually here every year. All the people at Lama are nicer than the people who were here last year <laughs> or the year after that, you know. So, and it's also always true. <laughs> <laughs> what is this Lama bean experience? You've touched on it a little. What is it to be a Lama bean that's so transformative and keeps some of us so connected here that we just feel like we're lifers? Well, I talked to you earlier at lunch about um, what an honor it was to be one of the three people who drove up that road. I mean, in spite of the fact that there was that horrible scene and it was kind of a guardian at the gates kind of event, it was, you know, is this an omen or is this that, this or that, that it was just such an honor to be a part of uh, the unfolding of a place that could serve so many people. Somebody told me yesterday that the mailing list was 8,000 people. Mm. And of those 8,000 people, I assume 1,000 or 1,500 have had at least a deep, as, as deep an experience in the Lama experience as I have, because most of our experience here is just grow, you know, growing up and moving through our cellular reality, and eating and sleeping and you know, getting along or not getting along, but there's this other thing happens if you're here enough, which has to do with learning what a human being is, being in such close familial, almost married contact with another group of people. It's like you come up this mountain and you're kind of naive about that, and then once you've been here for, well, I think it takes a month to take off your, hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> and then it takes another to take off your ideals, thinking that you can be a perfect being, and you know, I mean, I'll stay here another month and I'll be a perfect being. And then you start just being in the soup with everybody else. And there's this, uh, this melding that takes place so that, so that you're into, well, and it, this is true of me anyway, and I don't know whether I was always this way, but I finally defined it in the hospital where I work when somebody was trying to understand why I was so different than everybody else. And we just came to the conclusion that I assume I'm intimate with people until they prove me not so, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody else has to clang down that door that mm -hmm. says, I don't know you, you don't know me. Mm -hmm. You know, or it says one of those kind of, you don't know who I am. You know, and then I think, okay. <laughs> but I think that that's engendered in us because we sort of mix up so completely. And I think one of the things about marriage is like people are sleeping together every night, even if they're not getting along together, that this tuning happens by living a similar life in the same air. And because people don't really have individual lives here, everybody gets pushed together into this psychic. And God willing, inshallah, always here, there are enough healthy spirits, you know, to carry the, the spirits that have a kind of a negative place. That's what I've always seen. And always, you know, I mean, we all have this darker and lighter sides, and we all have a variety of capacities, but somehow, by the consensual process and by people's wills coming up and saying, I want this, and another person saying, I don't want it. There's a balance that's always here. And I guess I want the balance to be more extreme. You know, I want more darkness and more light. And I don't think, I'm not even sure you can get that balance without both of them in. That's why I'm saying, let's let some more crazy people in. You know, and as I'm saying, I'm not saying psychologically crazy. I'm just saying people who are not quite so normal and not so easy mm -hmm. to read. You know, because you can always get rid of them. You can just say, we can't stand you anymore, get out of here. You know, but just to, to put more juice in. Well, <clears throat> Lama, it's a real mystery what it does to a person. When I first arrived here, I feel like I was in my um, Mazoop stage, the, uh, one of the crazies. 
It's definitely. <laughs> uh, I've been taking this meditation course, a yoga course in California. The medita meditation teacher was very well-meaning and decided we would have this all-night meditation and uh, all eat some mescaline together. And um, So that's what we did. There were just a handful of us. And everyone else got up and left as if they knew when the meditation was over. And for me, it was like it put me in this place where it was never over. And through that experience, I came, I ended up here. Some people came through California and said, we're traveling and we're going past Lama, do you want to come? And I said, sure, that's really what I want to do. So I came and when I arrived, I was told I couldn't be here because it wasn't the proper day and it wasn't time for the business meeting. But I hung out in the forest for a few days and waited. And Zim kept coming, telling me, there's this girl, this girl, she keeps coming into my teepee. She doesn't talk. He invited. <laughs> oh, my dad. <laughs> but um, for me, when I arrived, it was a, like a real validation of, of a rest for my soul and a home. And for many years previous to that, I had traveled and traveled and felt very unsettled. And when I arrived here, I just knew that this was my home. And somehow it would always be my home because I was always able to to reach that place of quietness. And even yesterday, after 20 years of, of having come up the mountain, it was just this incredible sigh. Mm -hmm. It's time to listen to the wind and the pine trees mm -hmm. and be with all the beloveds. And it's been an interesting process watching the generations of beloveds because I've lived in I've lived in this area since that time. And so I've kind of experienced um, different groups as they've passed through. But yet it's always the same. That, that the way Asha was talking about it, it's like there's just an immediate knowing that we've shared something very deep and very special within ourselves whenever I've met anyone who's been through here. And again, it's validation of family and our, and our process together on the earth. And, and for me, Lama was very raw when I first arrived. Mm -hmm. And it was very abrasive. And of course, many, many changes. And through the years of watching the, the very deep work of the metta and the loving kindness, it's as if, well, we've all evolved together. And granted, it could be termed as um, growing up, you know, and going from that place of, of having taken lots of drugs and then gone out into the world and raised families and and all of that sort of process, but but still there's just a, an inner an inner space that's shared through all of that and through the generations. And Lama's has become much, much more refined. And somehow it, it's very hopeful for me when when I listen to that inside because seeing that the process of evolution throughout the Lama community and throughout the care of the earth here and in the world it just gives me great hope that even though we are faced with such incredible um, social conditions and injustices and all of that, that there is a place where we can just really be truly loving and caring for one another, caring for the mm -hmm. earth. You can kind of trust that that space is maintained it's here, maintained. and you can tap right into it. Mm -hmm. It's like a continuation of all the, the prayers of the mystics through the centuries. It's right here in northern New Mexico, right here, tangible. We can taste it mm -hmm. and feel it. I'm just deeply indebted. The grace, the incredible grace. 
do you find that even just seeing a llama bean in town, you can tap into that too? Mm -hmm. You don't even have to be on the land, mm -hmm. though it helps mm -hmm. tremendously. Yeah, it helps tremendously. But there's just that shared knowing. Mm -hmm. The veils don't have to be there quite so <laughs> intensely. Right. It's really okay to just be free. Yeah. Be real. Be real. Namaste. I'm interested in that because I've never done that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Newcomer. So, I'll, my name is Ruth, and I'll talk about um, how I got here. When, yeah, I came here in 1976. A friend of mine named Robin Smithson said, oh, we really need to go up to Lama. On Sunday, it's really fun. They do Sufi dancing, and you'll really enjoy it. And it was a spring day, and the ruts in the road were at least two feet deep. And so we walked, uh, Robin and my son and I, Nathan. Nathan is, was five at the time. He's 19 now. And we came up on a Sunday and we walked up the hill, we walked around the S-curves and it seems like we may have gotten stuck down there in the S-curves and we walked up in the muddy ruts and uh, Nathan enjoyed himself, he liked that walk. And it seemed that as we got higher up the hill that um, I began to enjoy myself more and more. And I, uh, when Robin had first invited me to come, to come with her, um, I, I remember refusing at least twice. I said, no, I hear that there are real um, uppity there, that if you haven't studied with your guru in India, that you're nowhere. And I, I have no interest in that kind of, um, that kind of um, silly uh, stuff. But when I got here, I felt the space, the space, the air. The quality of the air was uh, so overwhelming that I kind of lost all of my uh, uh, judgmental stuff around the Lama Foundation. And I was met at the kitchen door by Jamil, this uh, blonde kind of uh, wild-eyed fellow. And he gave me a big smile and he said, well, welcome, where have you been? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, well, probably similar places to where you have been. <laughs> we, kind of, we kind of recognized one another. And so that's how I got here. And, and the following week, I came up to a business meeting. And, uh, and it, it turned out it was the spring meeting. And it was a heavy spring meeting. It was, and I didn't know what a spring meeting was. I didn't know what a business meeting was either. And it was the spring meeting where Nuruddin, Steve Durkee, was uh, putting pressure on the foundation to uh, make their, their spiritual practice uh, known and to follow it uh, with great fervor in order to uh, be real. And so people were very tense and there was a lot of, uh, what is your practice? And I didn't see you at the sit Thursday morning. And, where were you anyway? And uh, it was very intense, and I had no idea. And I came in, and I said, I, I'd like to be here. And everybody said, shut up. <laughs> We're trying to talk about our practice. And I think David, David Powell said, said Would you, what is that woman doing here? And, uh, and so finally, Sadiq looked at me. He'd been sitting there like this the whole time, <laughs> just you know, through this meeting. And finally, he looked at me, and he said, OK, what do you want? And I said, I want to live here. <laughs> and he said, how long? And I said, oh, about six years. And he just <laughs> looked at me and he said, how about six days? And I said, OK, six days. And he said, on silence. And I said, OK. And so Nathan and I moved up here. And we were here going on six years, I guess, all together, which was probably, if anyone at the time had imagined that we would be here that long, <laughs> they would have probably just died. You know? But. Um, I think I came up for consensus more than any other person I ever knew who was here very long. It seemed like I came up for consensus each week 
Because she has personality and she's wild. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those. She's one of the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very tame, of course. I'm very tame now. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty silly. And I wore blankets and, and scarves and whatnot and squatted on the floor to eat my dinner and whatnot. And people <laughs> thought I was pretty crazy. <clears throat> so, I think in my case, um, as kind of as kind of spatially gregarious as I was, I was, I was such an isolated person, and just so um, frightened, and um, had so much armor, having been hurt a lot as a young person and as a young adult. And uh, at Lama, even though there was that raw, fierce, um, unforgiving, and, and hurtful quality to some of the social interactions that happened here, um, that still, you, you all had the, um, the agreement that you were working on your stuff. And I think that that's a real unusual thing. And that in the, most of the places where I've been, that agreement does not exist. And so even though you all may be wild and, and sometimes unhappy and, and hurtful, that you know that you really, uh, you have agreed that you will try very hard to, to become less distressed, to become more whole and more loving. And so for me, uh, it took, I was here for a number of years, and I feel like that it was the sanding of the edges, you know, like all my, I was a real pointy object, I think, when I came here. And, um, and uh, I feel like by the time I left that I, I was much better able to just be with people. And that really a lot of what happened for me was just learning, just having more confidence in myself that I was really an okay person and that I could, in fact, bond with other people was a real important thing for me to know. And it, it was one of the most important stages of my life. It, it gave me the ability, you know, helped me to go on out into the world and, and do other things. So I, I'm very grateful for having been here. And, uh, anybody have any questions? Or? About the time the tower house burned down. Oh, yeah, I was here for that. I was here for the burning of the tower house. Um, Peter Adams was preparing the tower house for his family to move into. Mm -hmm. No, okay. I've just found out that's no. not true. Nikki and I were going to move into it when I was pregnant, and I was pregnant with Emmanuel. They were at the double A, but Peter and I were it, doing the work on the house, but they oh. weren't going to move into it. Oh, no. oh, we were, well. This was where I was going to nest for my baby. So oh. I'm quite clear about it because oh. it was quite significant as I watched my nest burn to the ground. Oh, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> But somehow, I, I think, what had happened was that they had capped the gas fixtures and then had verithaned the floor in the greenhouse. And so it was thought that it might have been gases that uh, could have ignited somehow. And uh, in the night, uh, at some odd hour in the early morning hours, um, Calvin, who is now Andrew, was asleep on the, uh, on the deck outside of the potting studio. And he woke, and he sat up, and he looked at the tower house, and he said that it was glowing like a, like a lantern. It was just about wow. to burst into flame. It was just glowing, and then suddenly, boom! It just he flamed. saw it. So he saw it, and it just he was just, the only eyewitness. Of yeah, and so he ran to the bells, and he began to beat on the big bell, bong, 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 for hours and hours and hours and. I can't remember if someone took over for a while for him, but the sound of that beating of that fire bell, wow. bong, 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 and we all got out of bed, and Kim came with the chainsaw, and we were chaining down, he was chaining down the trees, and the tower house was very, you know, it was like four stories, if you figure on the dome at the top, you know, it started down here at this part of the hill, and it went up in stages, and um, so it was like a giant chimney, and it just, was the power of the uh, flame of it was was really outstanding. You couldn't get near it. And there was a, a green truck parked back behind it that uh, was parked next to a big gas tank, like a 250-gallon gas tank. 
and that truck melted entirely. The windows, uh, the windshield was in dribbles and, and stuff, and the gas tank in the truck had expanded but didn't blow up, and neither did the, uh, the big gas, the big propane tank, which was pretty remarkable. And if it had blown up, <coughs> I don't know what would have happened to all the hippies out there trying to put that fire out. And eventually, well, the neighbors all came, and I can't remember if the fire department even made, they didn't come for many hours, but finally they came from Cuesta. And somehow the fire was just contained. I mean, it would have taken the whole mountain if there had been any breeze at all. Wow. But somehow it stayed right there at the tower house, and it didn't move out. But our neighbors came with, uh, with water in their trucks, and they sprayed water all around for several days afterwards because of the stuff down in the ground that could burn again and, and burn up the mountain. And uh, the sound of that bell, you know, afterwards it was hard to ring the bells. And people weren't, you know, really, it was a shuddering kind of, you know, memory. Was that? that was, go ahead. That was true after the other fire, too. There was a kind of a sickness. Mm -hmm. We all felt this kind of sickness about after fire, and again, maybe that's just part of the symptoms of post-fire response, but a little ill. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We actually sat in a circle the next day up above the kitchen and dining room, sharing people's feelings because there was mm -hmm. such distress in the community <coughs> about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everyone had to get out their story of what their personal experience was in relating to that yeah. particular event. But isn't it great that it's not there? No, <laughs> yeah, it's so really. much more beautiful without it. I mean, I'm all yeah. for lingam worship. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty silly. It was sort of like you know sitting on the mall yeah. like this. You know, I mean, it, it it really did. It kind of took away from the other things that were going on. You know, oh. it was kind of up there on the hill, sort of pretty silly. Well, Ruth, I'd like to hear from you. It seems like your presence, your years, the Ruru years, spanned the kind of old guard. I mean, I'm using silly terms here, yeah. but the, you know, the Muslim era or the, the holy wars. Right. <laughs> and then moved into the, you know, the new post tower yeah. burning. And yeah. I arrived a few days after the tower burned. Oh. So, and I know that was a whole different era. Mm -hmm. What is your overview, perception of, you know, your era here? Uh huh. And yeah. Bringing it up to it now, if you feel to. Okay. I'll try to talk about that. That's. Uh, I was here at some at some really. Uh, the years that I was here uh, were. There were many transitions, and I imagine that there are many transitions for any group of years, and anyone is here. But uh, there were some major, very painful transitions during the period uh, when I was here. And one, let's see, since I'm not totally clear on the history just previous to my arrival, I'll just kind of hope that what I say about it uh, is, is, <laughs> is uh, marginally true. But it seems that Steve Durkee, that is Nuruddin, had become tremendously um, involved with being w with Islam, to the point where he felt that Islam was the only way, the only path of true integrity. And um, the ISC had been built, and his uh, he was over in the ISC with a following, and there was some feeling that that he wanted for the whole of the foundation to become Islamic. However, the foundation had not been founded uh, legally to be solely uh, an Islamic um, place. And uh, there were those of us who had come who felt really good about the, the purpose and function of the foundation as it had been written. And there were many people who had put in many hours of good work with the intention of creating the Lama Foundation as it existed through its purpose and function, its legal uh, um, uh, purpose, which was, uh, as I, of course, every, everyone has their own interpretation of what the Lama Foundation is uh, here to do, but whatever their interpretation, legally it seemed that it was not to be one religion. 
and uh, I felt very uh, committed to that, uh, to the foundation remaining eclectic. And uh, I was I was mostly involved with sitting meditation, with Buddhist meditation, and um, <coughs> so there were there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of struggle going on within the the Durkee and the von Briesen families. And actually, we never really talked about how that all worked, but originally there <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> As I understand it, <laughs> there was there were there was Barbara and there was Steve, and they were married and had. Steve came first. Oh, there was, Steve came first. The, one, the movement had not started. The women's movement was oh. was just the little you know, thing in history that burst up in the suffragette movement. Stuff like that. The women's movement was not yet going. With right. Steve and Barbara. It was Steve, Steve and Barbara. That's right. <laughs> And they, they eventually had four children, four girls. And actually, I wanted to, that's one theme that I would like to, uh, to talk about is how families have done here. And I think that would be a good thing to talk about with each person who was a parent here and how their children did and how, how we could look at that in the future, too. That's one of the things I, my, my, where my interests run is how the householder can be here in this monastic kind of situation, practice-oriented situation. Um, but anyway, so they had four beautiful daughters. And um, then Barbara's brother, Hans, was married to Francis. And they had three beautiful children. And um, then Francis and Steve got together. And Barbara and Hans, w well, there was, there was much turmoil. Freak that. Freak. It was freaky. <laughs> And those of us who sat on the sidelines, well, it was looked pretty freaky to us. Hans freaked but, away immediately. San Francisco. Yeah. Barbara tried to change the nature of human beings. <laughs> yeah. So, so there was a lot of um, there. There was just a, there was a lot. There was a lot. There. It was heavy mojo going on here at the foundation <laughs> with regards to the the founding families. And, um, and so that was one thing that was happening. And then there was the Islamic thing that happened for Steve and also for Francis, who became Nuruddin and Nura Issa eventually. Francis was Shaida there for a while. Actually, Francis was Shaida when I came here and became Nura Issa shortly after my arrival. Um, so the Holy Wars, let's see, well, the Holy Wars. There were a number of us over in the in the Lama Central area, as opposed. The, the, there was almost a lot. In fact, I think at one point didn't Steve put a, a barbed wire fence between the. There IRC. already was, well, there was because a gate. There was a cow. There was oh, a gate. Okay. There already. There always had been because that was mm -hmm. the fence that the Indians helped us put up to keep the cows out. Yeah. Okay. So so it was uh, it was a real us and them situation and uh, there were people who were invited to be here who were heavily Islamic and there were other people who came here and found that that was a, a very important step in their journey and became heavily Islamic and uh, much integrity there Salat five times a day and Ramadan and uh, you know some very beautiful practice going on beautiful wonderful zikrs that were just uh, I was very fortunate to be able to, uh, to participate in some of that Islamic practice and feel that that uh, really transformed my life, some of the deepest times that I had had here at the foundation. Um, but then there was the Quran and there were the rules and there were the regs and there were the interpretations of all of those things. And it got to the place where people, particularly Nuruddin, would come across the fence and accuse the women who were mudding the dome in their shorts of being uh, whores and kafirs and whatnot for not being totally covered. And um, there was threatenings of violence and it was, uh, everybody got sick pretty much was how it worked out. Most anybody who was involved with the administration of the foundation just kind of got sick a lot. And um, it was a pretty fiery time. I don't know if I, I mean, I, there are some people who could talk about that time and know the details of it much better than I, like Jamil. Well, I have just one thing I want to say. 
which, about this time. Because Come it's, here. It's, but, um, no, don't move. I'll just say it really quickly, which was the yeah. annual meeting in which it was yeah, all decided with Steve Durkee and Steve oh, Durkee and Hasman Greeson across the dome from one another. The Islamic men were all dressed in robes, and they even put black under their eyes, which none of us quite understood what that's for. <laughs> it was to shade their eyes from the blinding light of God. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, they used to put it on. The coal used to be put on in the deserts, right, to keep the sun from reflecting off their oh. things into their eye. So that's sun worship. That <laughs> couldn't be it. <laughs> A lot is not. But at any rate, so this story is not about Hans and Steve sitting across from each other. Hans being polite and Steve being impolite, but otherwise just the testosterone dance going like crazy, right? I mean, there's Steve with Hans's wife, and there was Hans having the general rule of it. And um, Steve was being kind of out of control, you know, shaking his fist. And all of these guys in their robes with their black under their eyes had a Koran, each one of them, in front of it. And this was, had gone on for two days, these meetings, trying to establish actually what it was was that that the, the Islamic group did want to have mom and they did want to get control and they were kind of working, trying to work out how they could do it and see if there was any kind of possibility. But this was the best and the sole excuse for me for this whole event was that the third day this guy named Latif, Latif means subtle, who is an artist and has been my art teacher for a long time, but he's just kind of twinkly and and uh, Steve said he'd lost his job on this very exotic magazine because he, he'd learned to wear three-piece tailored suits in England, but he always had to do something where like wear green pointy shoes. So <laughs> 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 At any rate, so on the third day when it was just to, already too much and they were still there and sitting there with their Qurans, Latif came in with a Turkish tight brown wool worsted suit and he had a Time magazine in his <laughs> arm, and he walked across, and he took his place in the line with all these Muslim men, and put his Time magazine down. <laughs> and I mean, it was just excellent. <laughs> it was just such an excellent moment that I was so grateful in terms of the whole idea of everybody coming down for a game. That moment was worth the whole game. <laughs> Anyway, that's all I had to say. Oh, I just had right. to give no, stay here, stay here, stay right here. <laughs> yeah, here. Okay. I love hearing you describe these events. Yeah, <laughs> I really do. I'm number one. I think that basically what I really appreciate is that Steve has gotten some really bad press that wasn't justified. I mean, yeah. he did think this place up. He did follow yes, it through. He, he was the creation of it. And he's a very shy man who has a big presence, and everybody wants to get a yes from him. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants him to respond positively. And basically, he doesn't ask for that attention. Mm -hmm. He has never asked for that attention. He's never wanted people to look at him or pay attention to him. He's always been uncomfortable in that, and I think a lot of his bad press has to do with being a shy person with an enormous presence who has never learned how to graciously respond to strangers, right? I mean, if somebody's mm -hmm. vibe upsets him, he gets upset all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, and he doesn't know necessarily, I mean, or he does know, but the person doesn't want to hear it. So I just want to put in a word. I know mm -hmm. he's rude, and I know he's hard, and he's been hard to get along with for a lot of people, but I think that he's also has been exaggerated by an awful lot. And partly for, those, for that reason is because he doesn't, he never had any way of getting people to stop paying attention to him because He's so big, and because he has this enormous presence, mm -hmm. so there was something else I forgot. Do you think? What do you think he'd think of Lama now, aside from the fact that it's not an Islamic community? Well, he couldn't think clearly of a, la a Lama because I think that his feelings were so badly hurt. Mm -hmm. Lama felt their feelings very badly hurt, but he felt his feelings very badly hurt too. But one thing that Hans or Sadiq said, which I thought was really accurate, was this, just the savage irony of him having come to this place and, you know, made this happen, and then to have set up a set situation like consensus, which was guaranteed to move somebody like him out, because mm -hmm. basically he is such an individualist and he, he really does dance to his own mm -hmm. tunes only. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's never, you know, he doesn't adapt to another tune unless it looks totally clear to him, and that's pretty hard. You know, I mean, if all of us look to listen to a tune, you know, that was really right completely on, which is the kind of ruthless path that he follows. You know, he just doesn't have a good capacity for compromise. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think he'd think of the earth plane, the improvements, the building, how llamas come I along? Don't think he cares. Yeah. I, he can't, I can't think. He's in Egypt translating a 13th century Sufi saint's uh, book. He has terrible tinnitus, and he's, um, he's a Sufi sheikh in the line of a sheikh in, uh, uh, I think it's the Al Azhar Mosque. And uh, he's living a pretty quiet and retired life with Nora and their two. They have two children, two girls, Fatima and Saida. He's still very much in the Sufi practice. He's definitely Al-Hazar a Sufi. Is very he's orthodox. Sufi. Yeah, he's very Sufi. He's very Sufi, and basically because of that, the Orthodox Islamic. He was Orthodox is Islamic, but basically he's always been Sufi in his heart. And his his confrontation with Lama, I think, is a really accurate one in the sense that everybody is all consistently forced to look at what their their interpretation of reality is. I mean, that's all all of our practices are is an interpretation of reality. What we think. You know that those words, God, Allah, whatever words. I mean, it's a subverbal experience, and how we're going to come out verbally and ethically in line with it. And so his, he he sees Lama, and he sees this kind of mushy, irresponsible, not satisfactory to him, and therefore not satisfactory reality. You know that it doesn't define reality in a way which makes a coherent whole. And it is true if you. If you go into Islam and you go into the Quran, I mean, of all the practices I've done in terms of life, right, of families and children, it does protect and support family and children in a way that this society doesn't even begin to touch. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it's only for history to say whether or not in terms of civilizations. I mean, and it's aesthetic, too. I mean, the whole nature of life has an aesthetic quality to it. and. I mean, this just gets into a dialogue that he and I have been into since we met. Right? Uh-huh. So, I mean, <laughs> it's endless because it's all different kinds of positions. But I think he would think it was for sugar nut, but however you say that in, in Arabic, I think. <laughs> I think he would be appalled at certain of the architectural changes uh-huh. that have occurred. You know, I'm appalled at some of them myself, but so what? You know, I mean, it's, we, he and I used to every line, you know, we'd have fights over mm-hmm. if we don't, didn't both agree. So, you know, and other people would fight over the architectural details because the visual part, right, how it felt was so important. And the, the fact of the matter is that the visual, the cosmetics, as Zim used to call it, were more important to us than the structural integrity. Mm-hmm. Now, there's my father who used to always say, I was built on a weak foundation, it will fall. Well, yeah. <laughs> it did. <laughs> Definitely did. The tower house did. The kitchen did. You know, kind of build it all up again. But I think that I think it wouldn't feed his needs mm-hmm. in, in any way. So I don't yeah. think, think much about it. Is it is and I think that's pretty irrelevant yeah. at this point too. Is anyone still in touch with him? Yeah, I am. Yeah. You yeah. think he'd ever come back to see? He doesn't even want to come to the United States. He feels like a foreigner here. I mean, they're in a really tricky position. I mean, in terms of being Americans who are highly Islamic, who don't even speak Arabic very well, much less all the other languages of Islamic countries, to come back to a country in which Islam is 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 growing, certainly, and it's growing very fast, but it's constantly just like Judaism here. You know I mean? It's on a continual dive in and out of different kinds of realities mm-hmm. and has that... You know, I mean, it's the fixity itself that's making it so refreshing about it. Yeah. And that fixity is hard to find. Of course, what he's finding everywhere is that there aren't very many true Muslims, right. as there aren't many true Christians. There are not, mm-hmm. You know, and this place is, to me, a really very deep experience in trying to find the, that the vocabulary which transcends the isolated (coughs) civilizations which have developed along with different religions. I mean, we're in this thing. When I went around the world, I realized what, you know, I mean, there's pockets. You know, there's always this mystical pocket of seekers, the Alice Baileys of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. They've gone throughout history, right, who haven't had a connection. Yoga, union, I mean, the word itself has to do with that. 
if you go to Hin India, you don't find many yogis. I mean, you have to find people who the word refers to who are either charming snakes or wrapping their bodies inside of each other, but they're not necessarily mystics at all. You know, because you can become... I mean, if you devoted your life to doing strange physical feats, I think you could do them. <laughs> so, Steve Durkee, I don't think he'll come back here. If any, uh, but, you know... You never can tell. <laughs> <laughs> you never can tell. And in 10 years, this may be an Islamic center, which he is the sheikh for. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if people don't keep coming here and it's up for grabs, which, yeah. it, which could always happen, I would favor that before a Boy Scout camp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you know? And that might be a great solution for everybody because then there would be a real Islamic center, which was Sufi in a certain sense, although there is the whole abacue one already, you know, so maybe Lama doesn't need to be it. But I certainly wouldn't object to that if, if Lama doesn't draw enough people and keep itself alive and mm -hmm. keep this one alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Time does pass, you know, and <laughs> things change. <laughs> I had a thought to talk a little about Sufism, which seemed to be one of the paths that really has taken the heart hear of okay. Lama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, we happen to have with us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should be Bob. Bob. Emmy Bob. Jamil, Jamil, honey? Jamil, 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 what is it about Sufism that you think kind of captured the heart? If any path That's has the taken the heart, the heart, I think it's been Sufism here. Do you agree? Well, no. people use the word Sufism to mean very different things. So first I sort of have to clarify my experience of Sufism and what I know about other ways that that's, that word is used and, and what a Sufi is. And there's the place personally that wants to bow my head and say, um, I only aspire on that path. And that to, be, to sit and speak as a Sufi mm -hmm. is not what I'm attempting to do. Yeah. Um, my connection with Sufism was through Murshid Sam Lewis. And that is the line of Hazrat Anaya Khan and Wendy Chisti and the Chisti line of Sufism. By the time that came down through Anaya Khan, who was uh, an Indian Muslim, he came to the West and his Sufism was very universal, meaning he, he called Adam the first Sufi, the first man who realized God, who was in God consciousness, and that his teaching was that anyone who had that inner experience and who sought that inner experience, inner experience was on the path of Sufism. Sometimes people say Sufism means knowledge or wisdom. Um, it also means purity. So his Sufism meant that you could sit and become Buddha consciousness and he could say as he did to one Buddhist master, ah, I see the Sufi in you. Now that's a point of view. You can worship Ram and come into realization through Ram. You can worship plants and flowers or your love of child and have the experience of God where self doesn't exist and there's only one and that could be in that big picture. That's that's you know kind of the biggest kind of Sufism. Then there's a traditional historical Sufism which comes out of Islam which it says that a Sufi is is one who has a kind of a mystical uh, understanding of Islam, but it comes strictly out of Islam. And there's lots and lots of places in between them. There are people who advertise Sufi retreats who um, I think are traveling salesmen. You know, I mean, and then there's there's all kinds of things. And it's like any of those words that came out in the 60s and 70s, they all got so diluted that I almost it's disrespectful to use the word. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, the, the Sufism of, of um, Murshid Sam's community of people and of Hazrat Naik Khan and Pirbalaya Khan um, 
then attracted this thing that was called Sufi dancing, which became another, with which I have great love and respect for, but in a certain way became a very watered down thing that people would do Sufi dancing and they thought they were doing Sufism. And the actual practice in Islam of putting your head to the ground of effacement, they call it in Sufism, not my will but thine, O Lord, that kind of thing sort of got lost in my point of view, for a lot of people in getting hot and getting high. So there's a whole element in Sufism about ecstasy of God. It's not it's not sitting facing a wall, as Mersh had said, you know, that kind of a, in terms of the kind of practice. So it appealed to a certain kind of emotional type. It's a bhakti path for most people. And yet there are kinds of Sufism, Nakshabandi for instance, that are more like a Jian Yoga uh, using the mind to go beyond the mind. So there's hundreds of different Sufi sects in the Middle East, and then there's another hundred kinds of Sufi New Age interpretation. I mean, I have to say that just for overall. I mean, does that mean? Don't sense? look at me. You're sounding oh. so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like, you know, we both, we have this tie with this, you know, and so, and I had this teacher, and to me, Sufism was this bursting open of my heart in, in this, because of a human being. That was the first step. And that is a whole story about Murshid Sam, and maybe that has a place because he has a place mm -hmm, at yeah. that yes, Lama. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Yes, <laughs> Murshid <laughs> Sam, must we never forget. Let me backtrack a little because my introduction to Murshid Sam was predicated to my summer with Ram Dass in New Hampshire in 1969, which all of which preceded my coming to Lama, and so they, they're connected. My getting onto the spiritual path was um, through connecting with um, Ramdas in 1969, he was just recently fresh back from India, and he was a Hindu. He wore all white. He had a long beard. He was just like in the picture books of Hindus. I mean, now I look at graduation <laughs> pictures of that whole group of the first year of everyone went to India, and it's like, it looks like an ancient, you know, kind of yellowed photo from Ramakrishna's book or something. He's you now Danny Goldman, all those people who know. <laughs> and everyone had gray beard. I don't have that gray beard. They were only in their 20s. You know? <laughs> so and he was in New Hampshire. And I was in Cambridge being a really uh, hip, whatever yuppie was in the 70s and Harvard and all this kind of stuff. And, 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 but it wasn't where I wanted to know. I was into educating people. And I wanted to know what was the purpose of real education. What did people need to know in order to live? And this is my burning question. I was 23 or something. And I went to the top. I was working doing research at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I found out these people didn't know but whatever I wanted, they didn't know. And that was that eight, that time when you know, I, mean, I wasn't doing drugs, but I was under the same astrological influence mm -hmm. of the 60s, which was something, this doesn't add up, you know, and it's, I want something, and this isn't it. And through a series of events, uh, a pretty story, but not necessarily to get into, I ended up one weekend, someone gave me a map and said, go here this weekend up to New Hampshire. And so I went with these two men, friends of mine, and Ram Dass was living on his father's farm in uh, Franklin, New Hampshire. And at that time, he was freshly back. It was before Be Here Now had been written, so the word wasn't out. He wasn't big and famous. I, I mean, <laughs> Ram Dass sounded to me like sort of a name for, I don't know. A dog. A dog, I was, it was even worse when I got to the soup, and it was Wally Ollie. I mean, those names are Wally, and this is nuts, you know. Yeah, I would even that Wally. Right, right. <laughs> and you're supposed to be happy when you got these names. <laughs> when somebody, somebody was so You were Munira for what? Terrible now. Munira. <laughs> what was it? I was Munira. I was also Kabira. Kabira. We all had many names. So sometimes you'll hear people referred to a mom, and you know they're people you know very well. They have another different alias. I remember someone who got his, was excited, Pierre Valai, I was going to give him a name as a side, but he got back to the Garden of Oliver and living very, looking very crestfallen. We all said, well, what's your name? And he said, Iqbal. <laughs> 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 and I was like, He's kept it, though. <laughs> and we he's kept it. Steve, Steve Durkee was Shanaz. Shanaz was, was Shanaz. You know, big right. nose was all I could <laughs> 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 so there were the names, you know. So there, that's part of, there was this whole foreign element to these other religions because most of us who grew up here, we were locked out of our family religion from painful experience. I was locked out of Catholicism, you know. I mean, God, I mean, I used to, I was an atheist if you asked me. Um, and, you know, I would do all these rebellious anti-church 
things in my earlier years. So anyway, I go up to this place in New Hampshire, and here's this guy all dressed in this white girl's outfit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he's sitting on a little knoll of a hill, and here's all these kind of hip-looking people sitting around him, and they're being very quiet. And I walked into that space, and I remember sitting down, and all I know is, it was like hours later when I got up, and it was, so I have no idea what he said, you know, Ram Dass's gift for, what did he call himself now, rent him out or something, um, <laughs> was like, it was like I was transported where everything I ever knew had words. Everything I knew inside had words. It was like the excitement in my being. My cells were shaking with, um, there's something, this is, this is the truth, you know. And then all of a sudden I realized that there was this, this softness in the air of all these people. I didn't know what, I didn't know anything about vibrations and stuff in those days and energies. But there was this softness and I was just trans figured. I was high, you know. I mean, I was one of those, you know, I smoked a little dope, but I was still, you know, wearing normal clothes and stuff. And uh, so this was like, this was something new and different. So we went back that night. I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I um, went back the next day, drove all the way back to New Hampshire. This time the other guys, they weren't so interested in coming back, but I was back and it happened again. And so that by the next day, I was scheduled to fly to California because the thing to do in Cambridge in those days, if you were seeking anything, you go to San Francisco. We, we didn't know it was there, but that was that was Mecca if you lived in Cambridge. Cambridge was the hip East Coast, but there was something more out there. So I had my ticket, and I was supposed to leave on Monday morning. I'll never forget. And I was into yoga. I was into alternate, uh, very radical theater company when I wasn't going working in Harvard. Um, and so I was into yoga. And I had learned this thing about quiet, still place from yoga. So that night, I stood on my head. And standing on my head, I had a wonderful <laughs> realization that I was just going to go back to New Hampshire and stay there forever. And I fell over. <laughs> and so I, everyone thought I had left the next morning for California. I didn't tell them because it That's was too weird. very zany. You know, I mean, she ran away with the guru was how it got described as the months went by. And I went up there and I went to the door of the farmhouse and I knocked and Ram Dass answered the door and I said, I want to stay. And he looked at me and he said, there's no room. And I was a very, I am not an aggressive kind of person at all. In those days I was 20 times less aggressive. And I felt it so strongly. I just looked at him and I just looked him right in the eye and I said, I have to stay. And he looked at me. And in those days, Ram Dass, always, when you said hello to anybody, you had to plan 10 minutes because you would do this eye contact <laughs> namaste <laughs> thing. <laughs> 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 And it was just total deep, uh, profound love and recognition. He said, yes. So I got to be there. And that summer, there were probably 20 of us who lived on this land. And I had my time. I'd never been in a tent before in my life. I knew nothing about nature. That's a big piece in all this puzzle mm -hmm. that Lama is and that the, the consciousness that came out of that time it has to do with we have this mother and we walk on her. And she has ants that come in your tent, you know, but they're, they're beings. You relate to them. You don't squash them the way I had been brought up, you know. Anyway, so I put my tent up. It comes to me because I put my tent up on top of a huge anthill because I didn't know what it was. But, um, and then the next morning, I, somebody said, when you hear the bell, go to the, well, it was like a big uh, barn. And it was 5 o'clock in the morning. This is pretty early, so it was like barely any light. And I go into this tent, I mean this barn, and I hear, and it's dark except for one candle in the middle, and I hear these people making these strange noises. They're going, And so I said, I thought, this is very weird, you know, and I thought I was in the wrong, I didn't belong there. This was something, you know. But I sat there, and then I just said, well, I'll do it. And by the time the sun came up, this thing was happening again, that um, the world fell away, and everything sort of dissolved into these um, cellular 
points of light and stuff. So, and at that point, uh, Rambas was not into drugs. In order to be there on, on that land, you couldn't have drugs. I remember going and burying my little stash of marijuana outside the property line. So I got there, and I, so I didn't do drugs, because that impression affected me for, well, I did it way later, but for the many years that followed, I never did drugs, because being there in New Hampshire, I was having what I found out later were very similar to these drug experiences, but I was having them through these spiritual practices in this, it was this pure, spontaneous community. There was something very special about that, because it had no structure, no plan, no form. And you basically did a lot of practice most of the day and two hours of work on the, his father's property, which, of course, my dad, who was a straight corporate man, when I would try to communicate what's going on, he'd say, you work there? Do they pay you? You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this whole thing would come in later. still say that. Yeah, so I, my <laughs> life was so changed, I could not even imagine going back to Cambridge. And Ram Das was going to have this spring retreat the following April at a place called the Lama Foundation. And he was going to hand pick some like three or four of us from this group. By, oh, by the end of the summer, this group, he would have Sunday darshans. Every Sunday more people come. By the end of the summer, probably, it must have been somewhere between. 500, I mean, so, I mean, we had to get really organized parking all these cars and all these people would come to the store. It was mushrooming at this incredible pace. So he knew it had to stop because it was getting out of hand and they'd have to leave. They'd just come for the day and he would sit and talk and we would serve them juice, you know. And by this time we were these moony sadhus. I went on silence for weeks at a time and wore blackboards and all this stuff in this guy Maharaji picture. I don't even know who he was, but, and, and Hari Das Baba, who was then Maharaji's right-hand man. And so I got to be picked one of these people who would get to go on an intensive at this place called Lama Foundation the following April. And winter was coming and we couldn't stay there in tents any longer anyway. So all I wanted to do was just live until April. Nothing mattered until <laughs> getting back here, you know. He, he really clung to those moments. Um, and there was someone there at that camp named, who's now named Shabda Khan in the Sufi Order, who we became well, it wasn't lovers because, of course, being Hindus, we were renunciates. It was a very Hindu path. There was, you know, we were celibate. We only ate brown rice and vegetables. I no longer, I cut out the beetles, and I, that was a big <laughs> thing for me. No, because you only chanted Ram Ram. And so he and I, he said, well, and he was one of the other people who was able to, was supposed to go to this thing in April. So he said, while we're waiting, let's travel across the country, and I'll introduce you to a Sufi teacher which I remember sounded like Snoopy teacher. I was like, what? <laughs> and so I said, oh, this is all on blackboards. He was writing this. <laughs> and I was madly in love with him, but it was so pure. I mean, we never touched each other. We sort of breathed together. That was the extent of our in intimacy, right? And so I wrote, yes, you know, of course you know him. And, and, uh, so we just went back to Cambridge long enough to get my things together, and all my friends were just in horror because I ha I was running away with a guru. I mean, I was I mean. Did Shabda have a, beard, a gray beard too? He had a, he yeah. had a, he had a black beard. He wasn't gray. He had a black beard. He, we only wore white. So we thought we would just continue this gig going out into the world of being these you know, <laughs> and you know. So we're in a, of you course we Nebraska. bought, we sold everything I had and everything I had, and we bought what you always traveled in those days, which was a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> okay. And you always Nebraska. decorated it with Indian print beds, and you had pictures of every guru you never heard of. I don't know, William Lee had Shiva in front of us. Oh. <laughs> and and we, Mayor Baba. And Mayor Baba. And Mayor right. Baba. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's how it all started for yes. me, actually, was Mayor Bob. Was it with you? Oh, yeah. I was, okay. in, I was in a relationship with a man named Danny Goldman, and he had this picture in his house of this guy, I, and, he had, and under his picture, it said, I was Rama, I was Krishna, and I, in my rational mind, said, how could he be two people at once? <laughs> and we had this hot affair, but every once in a while, Danny would be more interested in getting in this chair, and he would just sit there and look at this picture. So one day, when he wasn't there, I sat in his big chair, and I started to look at this picture, and, and it melted. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, Mayor Baba has an amazing darshan through his pictures. Girl brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't know? <laughs> and Danny Gulman is the one who gave me the map to go up to Ram Dass, mm -hmm. so blah, blah, blah. So yeah, Mayor Baba, I mean, Mayor Baba has a, a 
you know, I mean, he's such a strong part hey, of the Hey, everybody, is the real avatar. They come from near and from far. <laughs> they <mayor> for far. <laughs> <laughs> that was my only thing with him. I just had a one quick but anyway, yes, Mayor Baba. So we went out to California. Now I had this model of spirituality and we were holding on to it for dear life at this point. Of um it was a Hinduism based on what I call neti neti, which was not this, not this. Oh, any attraction, any desire, not this, staying in a pure state. So we drove across the country doing things like being in the present. So anytime I would say to Shub, they're like, well, why don't we stop at the next town and I could use the bathroom? And he'd say, future. <laughs> 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 and then he'd say, remember that song we used to, that other chant we used to do, that other bhajan? I'd say, past. <laughs> <laughs> We were really strong, but it wore on you after <laughs> two months living in a then. Future. Yeah, no, we, I, we couldn't. We didn't have chalkboards when we drove, but we. But things would happen like we would drive past. This would be with Tasty Freeze. And every time, I mean, my desire for ice cream was so enormous, and my guilt because all my old Catholicism came <laughs> right in that I was such a bad Hindu because I had these cravings. Now, partly, I mean, I'm. You know, he, next to this man, I'm totally desirous of month after month, and there was, you know, no, no, uh, what was it? What is the word in Hinduism for, you know, karma? Uh, I don't know. Lust is my <laughs> word, but <laughs> no, there was no carnal involvement. And being in a van and, and sleeping next to each other, because that was part of it, because that will make your shakti really strong. <laughs> I became what you call the shrew. <laughs> to California to see this guru, and I expect another Ramdas, right? And I expect... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, oh, we get to the oh. And this little shriveled up man is there. He is just so sloppy, and he's he's in there, and he, he says, right, uh, not now, I'm busy, and shuffled us in the front room while he finishes dictating a letter about politics. Now, spiritual people I knew from Ramdas had nothing to do with politics. So I am in this hag. I have traveled three months in this van. You know, we, we went to the south where they ran us out because of Ashant and Nanda pictures and all these things that were, I was just sort of worn out from this wonderful experience. <laughs> and so I was having all these thoughts. I was vibing shoved with, you brought me across the country to see this fraud, you know, and uh, this was my first impression, of, God forgive me, of mercy. And then he came in, he sat with him living, after he finished this, he was always, Mershid used to, Mershid had a, a hand in a lot of behind the scene things that influenced the thinking of people who then had positions in the world. For instance, he wrote uh, letters frequently to one of the editors of the San Francisco Chronicle, and I, later years, when I was living in his house, would find, he would write thought forms about feeding the hungry, just uh, all kinds of things. And then you would read the um, column of, I forget the, the writer's name, you'd read his column the next day, and his editorial would reflect Mershid's thoughts. Those are the kind of things this uh, Mershid's dharma was very much... Um, involved in the political reality of society and pain and suffering on a massive level, starvation of people, political inequality, uh, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, when I got there, I had a headset that was neti neti, and you didn't touch the world. Ram Dass was into not touching money in those days, for instance, you know. His guru had told him, don't let, don't touch money. So he, at one point, he had somebody else carry his money around for him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and that's the thing when he was also supposed to give up his inheritance and not put him through a lot of changes and stuff. So, but I had my version. I was reading Ramakrishna all the time. I mean, women in gold were the bad guys, you know. So, um, and politics was like worse than the hell realms. So, that was what Mershid was doing, and I was really um, very not open to this experience. And he came in and he, he sat down with us and somebody like Wally, I and mean, people had these really weird names. I mean, I had just gotten into the Hindu names and then it was Wally Ali and I forget, someone else was there. Maybe it was Banaksha. And he came and he sat down with us and he was just talking about random things. And I was so blocked. I wasn't really hearing Parking, them, but didn't he? yeah, yeah, he would, uh, you know, and, and, and then if you did, and then Afghanistan, and I want carrots for dinner and, you know, that kind of, 
Oh. All over. And I was, this, and all of a sudden he looks at me and he looked at my eyes and he said, he said, I know right away sometimes, I see it in the eyes. And he looked at me and I'm like, <laughs> no, I uh -huh. stay away from me, man. But that was what he did. So that he invited us to come for dinner and that that evening there was a dance class. And so we stayed and um, I just wanted to shower, you know, I'm much more interested in a shower. But I did stay and I watched at 7 o'clock all these beautiful floating hippies. Now San Francisco hippies were real different from Cambridge. Cambridge was still more anal retentive and, and intellectual as the kind of people there. And it seemed like every woman had long, long hair and sort of wafted in in these long skirts. People, women in Merchant's community wore long, women wore long skirts. And these long haired men who all their eyes sort of glowed, you know, they just, they don't, they ex surfers who had become Sufi disciples or something. <laughs> and they were beautiful, they were the beautiful people, my ideas, and they just, they were just gentle. And I, I just, I kept thinking, what are all these beautiful people doing with this fraud, you know? I mean, because I, I knew the real thing. I'd been, I knew Rambos, and I knew the real thing. And I had this headspace, and then he said, the Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram. And of course, he didn't sing the mantras right, because I knew how to do Sri Ram, Jai 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 Jai Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, 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 J
and he was in this room with his pictures of Maharaji and his white dhoti. And even in the snow and the cold, everyone wore these, it seemed. But they were the only two people. No one ever knew we came because everyone was being holier than we knew we were or something. And or they, uh, maybe it was very quiet, you know. And even if someone would pass you on the path, they'd always be wrapped in a shawl in their heads. Well, oh, that was the Ram Das retreat. Was was this the Ram Das retreat? That the first Hindi ashram. It was. There were two of them. That one. There was supposed to be one. And the second one was going to be scheduled for April. And that wasn't during the retreat, but it was somewhere. It was either before or after. It must have but been. There was a time where everything was silent and everybody went on. I had hepatitis and was down the mountain, but. Um, where everybody was being holy. Oh, well this was, I definitely was getting the holy Lama. I mean this was, it was very different from any Lama since that I've been privy to be present to. And and it was, and I loved it of course because I, you know, those of us who have these kind of, you know, memories of dark cave-like monastic lives, the quietness of it was so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so we got there and we talked with Ramdas a few minutes and he told, I think that is when he told us that there wasn't going to be the spring retreat. And what really was happening was some rift between he and Nervi and Steve. Is that true? That's what I recall. But I wasn't privy then at that stage of my I don't journey. know, because they did be, be here now that summer. I mean, we did be here now. Here was that next, su that next summer? Something? I don't know why it was canceled. I mean, I, this impression this I, got, fog, I was matter. a mother and I had other, yeah. I mean, there were a lot of other agendas going on, but, right. um, but when he first came back and he came out here, there was some to do it. Uh, this was probably the first retreat. Anyway, it's a lot of, we should probably yeah. bring it out. So, so anyway, it, it wasn't going to happen, the bottom fell out, but that was my first experience at, at Lama, was um, this incredibly pristine monastic um, and truly uh, sanctified space. And I left and uh, wasn't back for some years till after Mershid was buried here. And I, so then the whole Sufi period of my life happened. And Mershid died, and a few years after he died, I, I get the years mixed up, but I came out here to Bodhi Mandala, which was then run by a woman who founded it, who there was a lot of interchange between Bodhi Mandala, which is a Zen center, and Hamas Springs. Who was presently in a three-year Tibetan Buddhist retreat. Oh, she is. I wonder she is. And then about Michelle. the second and a half year of it. Wow. 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 She really, she took it. Yeah. Wow. And she had invited me out to teach Sufi dancing at Hamas Springs at Bodhi Mandala. And it was in that era in my life where I would sort of float place to place. There's something I'm not getting time-wise, but it doesn't matter. I think that was about 1973. And I spent three, ended up spending three months at, at Hamas and uh, practicing Zen practice and um, getting to really like wearing a black robe and not existing. It's a very wonderful deep practice. At the same time, there was this other part of me that was hungering for something. And they needed someone to deliver something from him as some building materials or pick up building materials from Lama. So I said, I'll go. And I um, they had one of those beige trucks, like they used to be one of those here, those, those great beige trucks, you know. The Kirill Sadiq truck. Yeah, I mean, every, it's, it's still it's alive. alive. It's it's alive. alive. Yeah. Oh, because there's one out in the graveyard. I was saying, looking at the junkyard, and there's yeah, one there. Two of them. Definitely. So I came up here, and um, it was like, just yafata after the Zen Center. It was like, it was so open. That time, Lama was just full of fun, and the kids were, mm -hmm. uh, there were so many kids here. And that first night, I managed to, as soon as I got here, the axle fell out of the van, which is perfect, so I got to stay for days while I got fixed, you know. And I realized I just about created that because it was, it, it just fed me so much. And that night, everyone was going down to something at Donna Hasley or something, and this experience happened that I will never forget, which was about it must, it seemed to me, and this is probably exaggerating, about 26 people, including many, many kids, got in this truck 
and went down to get in the truck and sang down the truck. It was, it was so crowded, I mean, with people and life and, and vivaciousness that I just said, this is home, you know, Zen isn't really my practice, you know, or, or that life, you know, wasn't my practice. So that was the beginning of switching my allegiance up here. And I wanted to stay for the winter. Will you hear that? I'm trying to remember. I don't know. I was running down a highway for what? what yeah, when you are were we? running down. Hey boy. I think it's before I, I might have been to a Boulder. Few more. It must have been 1972. No, Marisha died in 72. It must have been. Tell me somebody who's here. Who was there? Sadiq was here, Sakina. Oh, they Sakina. were just getting together. Berkeley had left. Oh. Berkeley. The, Sadiq was, no, Sadiq was it's still like building Berkeley's house. See, I get a little confused because there were times where I would come in the summer after that and I, so I had these little pieces and I don't know when they, and uh, Carson's mom, was here, Elizabeth was here, and oh. Fuzako. And oh, I was here, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure I was here. I think that was a great here. time. Yes, that, that was, was so <laughs> much fun. That was fun. when the family monastery yeah. was working. Yeah. I mean, because the family monastery was one of our big models, of course, because we had four children. Right, so you couldn't do it without it. So I mean, I insisted that there would be equal numbers of men and women, and if there were child, not too many children. I mean, the rule was that there couldn't be more than 25 percent children. I mean, there could only be one child to every four adults. I mean, I had a whole formula I made up by myself mm -hmm. that there weren't to be more than 24 adults because no more than 24 people could maintain an intimate tuning. Those are all things mm -hmm. I learned over those years, and that particular time had a magic of its own. I mean, that group of people of its own, would have, wherever we would have been, would have had something because it was it was outrageous. Yeah, yeah. and there were healthy families with outrageous. I mean, Fusako and Mino, I mean, just... Uh, we asked them uh, to leave because we wouldn't give them <laughs> consensus to stay. This is how we consensus didn't give me consensus. Mino and Fusako were here and they didn't have any problems and they, you know, were just sort of happily <laughs> <laughs> ever and after. And, and they didn't have an intense <laughs> practice, but they were, you know, they did all the practice as well. They were both incredibly confident. Oh. I mean, Mino was one of the better craftsman and had come here and Fusako did mm -hmm. batik and she she cooked great and she cleaned mm -hmm. up all the time. When we had prayers of thanks, like on Thanksgiving, she said, thank God for feet, you know. <laughs> 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 they both, I mean, they were both yeah. terrific and we just figured they didn't really need to be here, so we wouldn't <laughs> give them consensus. We wouldn't give them consensus and then they, would, they didn't leave. They just ignored it. <laughs> Oh, no, so I like now still <laughs> laugh at that. How she says, "Oh, she says, oh, Asha, you said I couldn't stay, but I wanted to stay. There was no reason to go. There was no reason to stay." <laughs> <laughs> she had this little thing, but she was just talking. These you would three imagine. Three glorious oh, Japanese yeah. girls. Mm. Glorious. Mm. Beautiful children. Mm. And there are other yeah. empty kids. Well, that would have tempted me to come here at that time. Yeah. I, Not I, for spiritual reasons, just because it was so fun. You know, yeah. it was a hearty yeah. mix. Yeah. And very just food of the heart. Well, it was also the first time we had a trip together where physically actually it was possible. I mean, up until around that time, there had still been, there was still kind of, mm. yeah, it was there past was still the building, building, building. Mm -hmm. fanaticism. So there were other things that could happen, yeah. like that. Yeah. It was part of it. Fuzako was doing a lot with the flags. Maybe the flags were sort of getting born then. And she was also doing those kimono things. You were selling those kimono yeah, things. Tibetan. Tibetan. Oh, right. Fuzako would just put it yeah, on Elizabeth and everyone would want to buy one. <laughs> she just was exquisite. So I asked for consensus for the winter. And I was pretty, I was a space case. and. Um, did not have a whole lot of feet on the ground. And um, I really felt like I was part of this family. And people seemed to feel I was part of the family. And um, when I asked for consensus, Sadiq said, and I will never forget, I have this great gratitude now. He said no to my staying through the winter. And he said, it's not, he looked at me, he said, it's not time yet. Which ended up being very prophetic and true. And there were a couple reasons I saw as that year unfolded why it was very propitious that I didn't stay at that time, but I was quite um, crestfallen at the time and um, so on. But I say that because there's a real thing about honoring your truth. I mean, one of the hard things at Lama is to say the no. I mean, 
And that was what his intuition was. And he was right on. And I did have a place, and I am part of the family. You know, and here I am, and it's all these years later, and now I'm a trustee of the foundation. But at that time, it wouldn't have been appropriate. And I know karmically what would have happened. I think I know what would have happened, and it would have been an error. So that was my first experience um, with Lama. And then my life unfolded in terms of how I then came back here. Because the next stage I came, then there were a couple of summers, and I was living in Boulder after that, and I came for a Lama Chimney retreat. He's a Tibetan teacher. I remember that was a wonderful experience. And I then would sort of come to one retreat every summer, but I was one of those people who said, I love Lama summer, but you'd never catch me dead here in the winter. Because I did, all I felt was cold and snow, and I had that first memory in that, you know. And then came, um, this was 1970, 1978. I, in my work with Sufism, I was initiated as a shirag, which means that you um, are to conduct, you are authorized to conduct something called universal worship services. And I have a very natural love of the universality of religion. It's like, it doesn't, if I walk in a circle and everyone is chanting Hare Krishna, I love it. I just am totally a Hare Krishna. If everyone is doing Zen sitting and you're with a Jigadutsu and all that stuff, I am perfectly excited and happy to be in, it's practice, practice is practice to me. And if it's real and if it carries the light and the energy, I'm there and form means I have real, I mean, the flip side is I always would say, I don't have a real form and I don't know where my real way is because I love it all. But anyway, I became aware that year in Boulder that one of the pieces in the universal worship that I did not have was Islam. That I hadn't had, I didn't know, I hadn't had experience with that practice. And uh, Sheikh Hassan, Hassan was in Boulder. Mm-hmm. Erdine came up for this Sheikh. Anyway, he was sort of set people afire in Boulder. And out of that experience, even though he was not an Orthodox Muslim, but I decided that I wanted to come here for Ramadan. Little knowing that this was the last, this was the year after the famous, it was, or was it the summer of, or the, the end of the famous annual meeting? I didn't mm-hmm. know uh, innocently about the Cold War that was happening. Or 77. The Cold War. 77 was the thing, was the... Okay, so this was the summer of 78, and I just, meanwhile, there are other ways in which I had connection with these fam- this family. I had met uh, Nuruddin when he was traveling with Pirbala in India. I was in India in 1972 and ended up spending time with them. And this is an aside, but it's not, because it's an important part. I knew Steve outside of Lama and um, traveled with him for some time in India. And... I knew a very, very, very profound person who I had enormous respect for. And there was a gruff, crazy man that I also knew who was a mad, he was a madman. It was my picture was, I called him a minor prophet and then a madman. But I had, um, I had a picture, I had a sense of this person who had vision that was so beyond what he could manifest and that he was there seems he was a tor- this is my picture of him, a tormented tortured soul there was a time when Pierre Valayat and uh, Taj Jamil and his wife then went to Ajmer to the tomb of Moiti Chisti and Steve uh, was then I don't know Shinaz, I think and I stayed in Delhi and we Steve asked them to ask at the tomb of Moiti Chisti a question about his dharma his unfoldment because there was a tradition that Moiti Chisti would give guidance when you go there. So Pierre Valayat came back and he said that he was told <coughs> by Moiti Chisti, he said, he said um, Shinaz, you will always be ahead of your time and you will always have vision and start things and, and in order for them to thrive, you will have to leave. And now I, it's interesting because my experience and whether that is, is Nuruddin's experience is I've seen that happen now in, in two communities in which he, he, ma- he is an incredible manifester. When he has a focus, I mean, he brings in the money, the talent, the energy, the special people, um, so that I had, so I had known him intermittently before coming to Lama in 1978 for Ramadan. Meanwhile, the drama, which you two would have talked about, had um, ensued, and um, the taking on of Islam had happened. When I knew Nuruddin, he was, um, very dedicated to Pierre Valayat, and he became one of Pierre Valayat's closest um, 
I don't know what he was a shake, he probably wasn't very far, but he was one of his um, close uh, teachers and, and followers. And he uh, did write a book for uh, and about Pirovalad's teachings toward the one you know, that book in that time period, right after India. So then in 1978, I came here for Ramadan. And um, it was a very, very different Lama. At that point, most of Nuruddin's friends had already left to prepare the way for um, whatever was going to happen. They were going to be Muslims somewhere else. I don't know whether Abiquiu was a seed then or not. And Nuruddin and um, Shaida, who I also knew from other places in my life, uh, we're preparing to go on Hajj, which is uh, one of the four five pillars of Islam. It's probably everyone knows. And, and when you prepare to go to Hajj, it's like preparing to die. You have to have everything in order. You, you, you have to, if you do it really traditionally, you don't own anything. You let everything go when you go. So something was happening just in preparing for Hajj for them, and they were living at the ISC. And an older man named Abdul Hadi was sort of an odd character who was sort of the valet to the scene over there, was living over there. And no one else except Mika would even go near that part of the land. There w I mean, the sense of the wall of the separation was so profound. It blew my mind because I had, you know, I had How long were they there like that? I didn't know. This is all new to me. Oh, yeah, you were. No, she I was, was down in the hill. Down in I was the art editor of the yes, house. Yes, that's right. You were, you were, or you were writing. The Living paper. in Mabel Dodge. Yes, yeah. because I remember coming to see you there. Doing the zikr. Time. Yes, doing zikr. And um, and there was a weightiness in the and and a waiting because everyone was just waiting for them to leave. And I, I'm coming to Ramadan, and I love Lama, and I love them, and I love people over here on this side. And this was an intolerable position to be in. Meanwhile, Mika was one of the people over here, but he also.